sometimes people come to me because they have explicit awareness of trauma and most of the time it's just a guy who has premature ejaculation or some women, women who've never had an orgasm. Some women are just like, I don't know how to ask for what I want in bed. Or some women are like, I don't know how to have boundaries. I need to learn how to reclaim my body and have boundaries. Journey. My name is Dr. Hazel Grace Yates and I'm a sex coach and educator. People call me because they want good sex and it's not happening for them. When they get on the phone with me, they say, I've never shared this with anybody. I feel really nervous to talk to you because you're a stranger and this is the most intimate thing I could possibly think of. In our collective, there's not places for us to talk about, there's not places for us to learn about. The most natural and sacred and birthright thing that there is, which is sex. The thing that blows my mind all the time about talking about sex is that we were all born out of an orgasm. Like our very existence was, was created out of pleasure. Yet it's the thing that we both sexualize and have it in our faces all the time, yet it's totally in the closet and it's taboo and we don't actually talk about it. What I do with people is I provide a warm, loving, welcoming, non-judgmental space for them just to get to share what they're facing and what they're dealing so that they can have more connection, more pleasure, more love, and more freedom. And the thing that I really love about my work is that not only does it help people in the bedroom, all the skills and the capacities that I'm teaching in the bedroom translate into the rest of their life and their family at work, like asking for what you want and being able to receive, like how much that matters all throughout our life. Hi and welcome. I'm so glad you joined us. Our special guest tonight is Dr. Hazel Grace Yates. She is a sex intimacy and relationship coach. Welcome to the show. We're going to have so much fun. Yes. I'm so excited. I hope we get to talk about sex. <laughs> well, I was thinking maybe we would. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so tell me about your work. Tell me about this whole industry. You're helping people come out of shame and guilt. You're helping them go into pleasure. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about kind of where you got into this. Yeah. Why, why yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. I would love to start there because that's that's at the heart of it for mm -hmm. me. And I was introduced to sexuality when I was 16, not by choice, by force. Mm -hmm. And you also. And I was 29 years old when I actually first discovered my clitoris. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, sexuality just wasn't talked about in my house. And it was in the silence that I learned everything, that it was taboo and that it was bad and it was dirty and it was wrong. And, were you, were you mm -hmm. given a religious narrative or anything like Yes. Oh. Well, I was given a religious n narrative and then I also like upped the ante and my family stopped going to church and I became Baptist and I was, I was, I, I committed myself to not have sex until I was married. Yeah. yeah. And so I was, I was on that ride. Mm, a purity ring and all the things. Not whatever. quite, but okay. oh, close. Okay. Well, well yeah, close. We'll get there. We'll get, it'll get there. So um, I was 29 years old and I was at Burning Man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Uh huh. And I did this uh, workshop called Orgasmic Meditation. Oh, the own practice. Yes. Yes. And I thought it was the scariest thing that I could think to do. So, mm. of course, I did it. Mm -hmm. And I went to this workshop. I found someone randomly and asked them if they would go to a pussy stroking class. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. And he, he was like, "Sure." I had just met him. I think a couple hours before that. So we went yes, to there. Yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know too many guys who are going to say no to that. Yeah. But just, uh, just a guess. Uh huh. Uh, so we went into the workshop, and all. What I realized it was actually the first time the head of my clitoris was touched, mm. and oh, I realized also that the years before I was telling my partners to never touch me there because it was my urethra. I uh, thought my clitoris was my urethra, yeah. and so it, at first there was like tremendous pain, 
and I had to get some coaching around it. And, and now I'm realizing there was trauma stored there from mm. um, being touched without yeah. permission. Being, yes, yeah. without permission and with force. Yeah. And um, I, oh, when I actually was able to transition from the pain to the pleasure, it was like I had never experienced before. But more importantly, I mean, that was great. Like pleasure, awesome, orgasm, amazing. But who I felt like I was the next day, it was like I could stand taller and I felt like I felt like a woman for the first time. Wow. And I felt like I had access to this whole part of human experience that was completely shut off yeah. and I didn't know I was allowed to. I didn't know it was possible and so it changed my life. And so I was very clear right after that that I want to devote my life, my life work to helping people who were like me, mm -hmm. who were in pain or didn't get educated or thought that sex was mm. bad. Which is a lot of people. Yeah. It's a lot of people. It you is know, we're here in the, the West where people. sexuality is uh, based on uh, America mm -hmm. formed by a bunch of Puritans who came over here to do the Lord's work and sex was mm -hmm. shameful and there's so much shame mm -hmm. associated with sexuality, mm -hmm. you know, specifically yeah. in the Western culture. I mean, mm -hmm. we dealt with that. I mean, we got married so we could have sex mm. because it was, we were in that yeah. narrative mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it was not cool to have sex until you were married. Yeah, boys and, and girls get together and if they want to have sex, well, they can only do that in the religious yeah. context of being married. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and so for us, even, you know, our marriage, that's something we had to deal with is um, bringing out of that blame, shame, and guilt of why we got married mm -hmm. into a completely different space with a completely different reframe. And what was the first space we went into that helped us work through those sexual issues? Orgasmic meditation. The own practice. Yep. Orgasmic wow. meditation. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wild. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So and you're sitting here telling this story and I, I'm just like how <laughs> that practice really, I mean, for me, mm -hmm. it just opened me up to a different mm -hmm. level and um, you know we'd been going through a lot of rough times with one of our children having some a lot of issues mm -hmm. and um, it was very very deep and I was kind of closed off because of all of that mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but you know getting back in or getting into that just mm -hmm. did like a, a 180 mm. yeah that sounds like a pretty dramatic shift to go from a marriage that was on this container and that you had to disassemble it and then recreate it from there. Yeah. And that's literally like just over the last two years is been the recreation of it. Yeah. And besides the, the own practice, is there something else that made a big difference? Oh, um, we'll keep going down that journey. <laughs> we can, okay. we can we'll, we'll get to there. Going. All right. But this interview, okay. in addition to that content that we'll get to, mm -hmm. is about your human journey. Okay. So <laughs> Great. But we don't mind sharing. We'll okay. get to that point because that's part fun, of our story. Fun, juicy conversation. When, when you are uh, going through the orgasmic meditation practice, you, you said you're 29 years old. I was 29. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a new thing to you. So I'm very interested in your reframe from whatever the shame, guilt, whatever the narrative you had, sex mm -hmm. was bad or not mm -hmm. good or something. Mm -hmm. what, at that point, was yeah. sex a not good thing for you prior to that? Uh, it's like a dark hole. When you ask that, it's it's like it doesn't it didn't exist, or mm. if it existed at mm. all, it was just because they do not... a demonstration. There's a lady there with oh, her yeah, legs up, yeah, you know, yeah, and and she's enjoying herself. Oh, okay. So they they said, so share what you're noticing, yeah. and everyone in the room was like, or the dome rather, because we are at Burning Man, uh -huh. and everyone was saying like warm and hot and turned on and tingly, and I am having an internal panic attack. Because I'm like, they're hurting her. Is someone going to protect her? And like, this is inappropriate, yeah. and we shouldn't be doing this. And I was, yeah. I was like, I still to this day don't know what allowed me to stay in that room, allowed me to get down, and to do this with this guy that I had just met. Like, I still don't know. It was, it, it was almost as if something else was there with me to support me through that. Mm. Absolutely, it was like. Your soul was saying, it's time to switch, babe. You need to go down a different road, yeah. huh? Right. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, 
I mean, to me, you talk about my human journey and what I think about who I am is a lot of people think that I'm uh, fearless and it's actually the opposite. I literally, like I said, I said, that sounds like a really scary thing. I'm going to go towards it. Mm. And that's mm -hmm. who I am in my life is courageous because mm. I have so much fear. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to the point mm. where my capacity for feeling discomfort has expanded and mm. allowed me to continue to, to face things that are scary. And I do that as, 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 as a spiritual practice, because what I found over and over and over, when I lean into the scary thing and I'm able to be with it and able mm. to love myself, there's actually a lot more freedom and, and ease on the other side. Mm. Yeah, living on that edge. This is where I like to be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so had, had you been in relationships prior to that and through your 20s? Yeah, we had. I mean, yes. And this is the crazy thing. I had been in relationships and I did have sex and sometimes it was somewhat pleasurable. And I did actually have orgasms, but not because I knew where my clitoris was. But imagine all those men that I had sex with between the age of 21 and 29 and when I told them this is my urethra and they were all like, okay, I won't touch that. Oh. Right. So to me, it's like, I wasn't educated and neither either they weren't educated or they didn't have the curiosity or the something that explored the yeah. innocence to be like, mm -hmm. Oh, let's explore it and check it out. I and mean, this is what I teach people now, but um, that's, like, that's what a lot of this people stuff is taboo, taboo areas. I know. Yeah. Well, that's I, what we were taught. I'd we like to give presence to that too, because mm -hmm. as a married man for, we had been married for 28 years. I had no idea of the importance of the clitoris. Mm -hmm. And it was through the orgasmic meditation practice that I realized, mm -hmm. oh, that's where the action is. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. as a dude, you're like, where's the vagina at? Because mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that's where the act is d done. Yeah. And as a man at that mm -hmm. time, I'm like, oh, well, that's where that's where the action is. And then I'm given this whole presence to the clitoris mm. and the whole other range of sensation that she can experience, uh, giving her the opportunity to relax and surrender into it. Mm. And what I loved about the container was it was a container. It's not sexy time. Mm -hmm. The man's fully clothed. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the practice, you're wearing gloves. You mm -hmm. have a certain kind of uh, organic lubricant that mm -hmm. is able to maintain its viscosity. Oh, and, good uh, word. I'm telling you. And, uh, and then you're given a practice. There's a certain place where you put your hand on the right and a certain place where you put your hand on the left. And it's a focused meditative process and she's mm -hmm. enjoying it i'm like okay focus mm -hmm. focus <laughs> and it creates a presence a focused presence so her experience is much different than mine would you like to talk about that okay <laughs> sure <laughs> so my you know to me it was actually one of the most amazing parts of the practice is it really teaches you to be present mm. And if you're not present in that moment, mm -hmm. you're not going to get anything out of it, mm -hmm. but irritation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. but mm. Honestly. Well, you learned your or, voice too. Mm. And then, yep. I learned, I definitely mm -hmm. learned to be able to speak what I like, what I don't like. And which is what most partners actually want yeah. is the information <laughs> about what you want yeah. so that you can make you more like pleasure. This? Is it good? Oh, yeah. it's fine. It's fine. All right, well, like, I'm going to do my thing. You know. Right, well, that, I mean, that goes into women's cultural programming, which is to be pleasing. So um, there. there's a study by Mahalik that uh, says what are girls' norms in America? Like what makes a girl go a girl according yeah. to our agreements of our cultural norms? And it's to be quiet, to be nice, to be pleasing, to be small, yeah. to be quiet. So that's our cultural programming is yeah. the, is to not ask for what we want. Mm -hmm. And here the men are oftentimes in heteronormative relationships mm -hmm. um, wanting information of like, how can I please you? And we're like, mm -hmm. no, it's, everything is fine. And there's this huge disservice yeah. for both people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that fostered that was to just being in that religious context that we were in mm -hmm. really kind of does those kind of 
things that you talked oh, yeah. about, those behaviors. You put the kids in bed, you be real yeah. quiet, you turn the lights out, only missionary style. Mm. You know, so it just <laughs> Well, not really, that. but I thought it'd be funny if I said that. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you do, you're like, shh. And it's mm-hmm. in sexuality in the religious context is there, they will always tell you, oh, sex is amazing. Oh, it's so good. God created sex. Just make sure you're married. Don't even look at a woman. Because if you look at a woman and you lust her in your heart, it's as if you committed adultery with her. Ooh, so there's all the shame that you know, us men have because we're like, whoa, she looks good. But, mm-hmm. oh, you know, you don't want to have that lustful look. And then the women are shamed because their bodies is like, hey, you're wearing something that might make me lust after mm. you. So now I have to put this context of I can't look at you and you have to have turtlenecks and dresses down past your ankles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you mm-hmm. lived in that, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, there's... There's a great book called The Erotic Mind by Jack Marin, and he has he defines um, eroticism as attraction plus obstacle. And there's four different cornerstones, and one of them is actually shame. Like shame can fuel guilt, can fuel eroticism. So it's it's yeah. laughable because I I think of some of the religious communities, and they actually might not be aware that they're actually fueling. Yeah. It, yeah. Because they're making it at like, you know, say, yeah. don't think about an elephant. Right. Right. You're going to think about an elephant. Boom. Right. The elephant. But don't do that. Don't do that. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. actually highlights it more. Oh, yeah. yeah. Makes, yeah. makes that little kid want that toy even more. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, I had so much shame as a kid growing up in that religious context around masturbation. I was no. like, oh, no. Oh, I have this desire and this urge, and oh, and then I relieve the tension, and suddenly, oh, boom, here comes the guilt. Mm-hmm. So I used to think about this. What's worse, the guilt or the desire? Mm-hmm. <laughs> as, a, as a kid growing up, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to church and trying to do the right things, but again, that shame, and, and there's no release for it because mm-hmm. you're told that that's an impurity, mm-hmm. uh, and then, of course, you can't have a partner because you're not married. So what is what do you do when yeah. when you're a kid with that? You just hide it. Mm-hmm. So you do, you learn secrecy and you learn to hide it all. Mm-hmm. So much shame based around that. Mm-hmm. And for us, I know for for our relationship, the orgasmic meditation practice allowed us to come out of that. Mm-hmm. And it's a vulnerable position for the lady because her Very legs are vulnerable. there. And and I remember Gail and I was her yeah. partner. She was my partner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even at that, she was like, Ooh, are you sure? But it's a container. There's no sexy time. Mm-hmm. You, you, yeah. you make the nest and there's a pillow and there's a certain mm-hmm. way and mm-hmm. uh, and it's a practice and it's a timed 15 minute practice. Mm-hmm. And then it's over and it's not yeah. goal oriented. Mm-hmm. The goal is not for her to achieve an orgasm. It's for her to learn mm-hmm. to be in that space. Mm-hmm. But you do. And sometimes more than one. You're welcome to <laughs> well, have that you, you might, and maybe not everyone does, because there right. actually are about 10% of women who are anorgasmic without, mm. like, without actually having experienced an orgasm. Yeah. Mm. Um, when you talk about just the positioning, mm. that when you've had um, trauma, mm-hmm. sexual trauma, mm-hmm. I noticed that was probably the thing that um, what felt most vulnerable for mm-hmm. me totally you know and actually getting past that and allowing that trauma to release mm. is was a huge ga- game game mm-hmm. changer mm-hmm. really yeah 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 it's super vulnerable position and what i really do like about the pra- well there's a lot of things i like about the practice but in particular is the grounding yeah. and you know, communicating, I'm going to touch you here now yeah. and doing that because yeah. it is a very vulnerable position. And there's also so much, um, one of the top plastic surgeries is, how do you pronounce it? It's labioplasty. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So, so many women have shame around the way that their pussies look, yeah. that they're doing, it's, it's like one of the top yeah. surgeries that people elect to do. Mm. So talk about the vulnerable position of just like right. as physical women, like we're smaller and like that's very vulnerable, but also there's a lot of shame of what it looks like. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's They're- why I do a lot of pussy reclamation and pussy adoration yeah. and having people actually look at their pussies and learn about them and teaching partners how to get to know them from, mm-hmm. from a place of innocence. And, and whenever I say innocence, I... To me, innocence is sacred, 
right? Like mm-hmm. when we come out of the, when we come out of the womb, there's this like innocent child and that's to yeah. me is sacred. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I really like to work with people is, is from that place of curiosity. Mm-hmm. And like, there's no, like before the shame was there. Right. Yeah. So, cause you're talking about different pussies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so I was talking to somebody today and it was, she was sharing with me some things and we started going into sex lives and orgasm and she, and different pussies and that there are, and you know what? I didn't know mm. that they are, were, that there's a whole like different kinds of them mm. out there and they all orgasm differently. And, mm. and she'd never heard that before. And so when I started sharing that with her, cause I learned it from the Kodoshka mm. and, um, it was like freeing for her. She's like, oh, maybe there's not something wrong with me, mm-hmm. you know? It, it, so that education is so important mm-hmm. and just a lot of us don't get it. Yeah. I got mm-hmm. grown mm-hmm. up. Yeah. Besides you were with a boy, we need to have a talk. Mm-hmm. You know what can happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know what can happen. Okay. You know what happens? Uh-huh. Okay. Talk's over. Okay. We're good. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Wow. Yeah. That's pretty intense. That was, that was the talk. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my flagship workshop, which is a full day process, which is actually what I got my doctorate degree in, invites men and women to share their stories growing up and now around their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And one of the first questions that I ask, and it's, men are in the circle sitting together and the women are witnessing Mm -hmm. them on the outside. And one of the first questions that gets asked is what were you taught growing up? Yeah. And I've done this with 1600 people and like a significant majority of them are like, I was taught nothing. Mm. Yeah. And, and that moment, it's almost as if I can feel all of the women on the outside all of a sudden feel all this compassion because it, it's oftentimes the first time for a woman to actually be with. Mm. They weren't taught either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're fumbling around in the dark and they were little boys and no one helped them out. Mm. And so no wonder <laughs> they've yeah. made the choices that they've made in their lives. Yeah. yeah. They just don't know how to handle it. Yeah, there's no education at all around sexuality yeah. because of that shame concept. Well, what education we do have in the states, most of the education we have in the states is what not, why not to do it. Well, and you're going to get yeah. pregnant or you're going to get an STD and that's yeah. like, that's the kind yeah. of extent of it. Again, there's shame based or, on or that. Or the abstinence. Yeah. See, I which, grew up in the 80s yeah. and that was the big abstinence push. Everybody's like, ah, just don't have sex. And we're like, oh, okay, good luck, good luck with that. <laughs> Right, which statistically they have the highest pregnancy rate Absolutely. with the programs that that teach abstinence. Whatever, yeah. whatever I'm telling you not to do, you're going to be like, oh, well, guess what I'm going to go do, right. just like you were talking about. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. You know? So your PhD was based on uh, sexuality and you're gathering data. What did you do with your study, your thesis? What mm-hmm. are you doing in, in shifting consciousness with your mm-hmm. workshops? Well, this is the primary workshop. It's called Healing the Divide Between Men and Women. Mm. And the concept seems so simple that it would seem hard to imagine that it's actually shifting culture Mm. and shifting humanity, and it is. And, And really all it is is asking the people the questions that have never been asked Mm-hmm. and giving an opportunity for people to be heard and they've never had the opportunity to be heard specifically men and women hearing one another and time and time again what happens is i mean it's appropriately named healing the divide because what happens is the women are see the men and they're like wow we actually have a lot of the same similarities and we're way more alike than we are different. And there's this compassion and this, and this mm. care that I get it. It's not there before because a lot of women have been hurt as a collective. A lot of women have been hurt yeah. Yeah. by men. So it's, it's, it's kind of a bold thing. I'm asking women to be compassionate and curious about the people that statistically have hurt us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they do it. And mm. it's, amazing it's wow. extraordinary it, it happens and then also on the flip side of that um when the men boldly and courageously sit there for an hour and a half 
and they listen to women tell their stories, both the celebration and also the painful stories. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's an intense thing for them to sit there because there's this there's this instinct that they want to do something and they want to act and they want to fix and mm-hmm. they want to prote- like protect. Yep. And the yeah. only thing they're doing is just sitting. And they're feeling all that there is for us to feel. And it's a very, they're usually overwhelmed because they're like, I don't know what to do with all these feelings, with this rage, with this care, with this respect, with this awe. And, and what I see is that the men leave there being that they're going to be a stand for us in a way that they weren't before Mm. because they didn't actually like feel the impact until they were in that, that space with us. Yeah. So um, that's what I'm up to with with my workshops. Mm-hmm. And well, we had a friend of ours mm-hmm. attend your workshop this last weekend. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we got the juicy lowdown. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and uh, she was absolutely impressed at mm. how much it helped her. Mm. And uh, she was mentioning some of the things that you know were spoken and uh, the questions that you asked. And she just uh, walked away from it very much a part of her healed. Mm. And so I wanted you to know that Mm. it's good work out there, girlfriend. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And the thing that continues to surprise me is in that particular workshop this last week, there were several women who are sex therapists or sex coaches that were saying, I didn't know this about men. Hmm. Wow. And, and and like even people who've been doing a lot of work around this, the simplicity of this and going back yeah. to the roots of us as, as of our childhood. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's like somehow this has been missed even in mm-hmm. the realm of sex coaching and sex therapy. Yeah. She was like, this conversation needs to continue in this mm-hmm. area. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I have uh, <clears throat> been, I have, someone has given me information that I have never thought about, and that is, as a female, you always have an underlying anxiety of being potentially a prey for an aggressive man. And that's something I never thought about, because as a female, you're putting yourself out there to be with a man that could physically, maybe he's bigger, maybe he's imposing, maybe he's going to ask you to do something against your will. Um, and the conversation started with someone who was dating a female MMA fighter and his buddy was like, Hey, how do you feel about dating a chick that can kick your ass? And he's like, Oh, I never thought about it, which still led this conscious conversation of don't you realize that's the potential feeling that a woman can have around Mm -hmm. men Mm -hmm. and which impacted me. I'm like, Oh, body language is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my, my desire is I think most men we want to provide and protect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I imagine the, the guys in your workshop are just like, like you mentioned, they've got all this, oh, all these emotions and they want mm-hmm. to hurt somebody for the, you know, and they want to give a mm-hmm. care, but they need to rest with that. But just that presence of being a man to be aware of, you have someone that has the potential to feel vulnerable about you and how much of a responsibility it is as a yeah. male just to be, just to be cognizant of that mm-hmm. and, and not to be flippant, um, you know, doing things or making comments. Uh, I, I'd be very interested in your female perspectives on that. About the vigilance? About just being in the space of making yourself vulnerable, but yet mm. having a guard up because you just, especially in the new situation, you mm-hmm. just never know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it doesn't ever turn off mm-hmm. and it doesn't yeah. ever go away. And I'm a strong, fiery, confident woman. And yet that vigilance part of me doesn't ever really turn off. Oh. And there's a saying, I don't know where this came from, but it's, it's hard for a man to get that it's hard for a man to get what it's like to be a woman. Yeah. And yeah. just as equally important, it's hard for a woman to get that it's hard for a woman to get what it's like to be a man. Yeah. Yeah. And of course we can't know what it's like because yeah. we can't live unless you're trans and you actually got to live in this life mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. in both spectrums. But that's yeah. a very small percent. That's a very small percent. And yeah. they can't have lived their childhood. Right. Oh, again, right. Or like yeah. whenever they, they transitioned. Right. 
or they can't the, do that. Yeah, just the <clears throat> wounding, the whole patterning, all that stuff. Yeah. Right. So because that, that's why this workshop is so powerful mm -hmm. because for one day we're given like this glimpse into the other's life in, in seven hours mm -hmm. and, and it's a big dose and it's, I'm excited for you to experience it yeah. someday. <laughs> yes. yeah. We are too. Well, given that, oh, uh, I would like you to give presents to that too. Um, no, I agree with her, especially um, just have had, because I've had trauma in the past, it adds more of that element to it that you're always a little bit cautious um, in that. And, you know, some things will trigger you that you didn't expect to trigger you at different times. And so that kind of can heighten it at different moments. Hmm. But yeah, yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. On this cosmic journey, one thing I've been learning is that we chose to come here as a soul that is a spiritual being having this human experience. We made a choice to come here. We mm -hmm. picked out our body. Mm -hmm. I read Dr. Michael Newton's book, Journey of Souls, and he talks about over and over again how people go into mm -hmm. hypnotherapy and they remember their life between lives. And you picked out your body, you picked mm -hmm. out your parents, mm -hmm. you picked out your birthday, so it would hit some astrological signs. Um, you did a lot of pre-birth planning, and this is a new thing. A lot of people are like, what? I was just born, and my parents had sex, and here I am, and I, I'm a victim. I, it's no will or volition of my own. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in a spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we chose to be here. So we pick our gender, mm -hmm. and there's something our soul wanted to experience, and the people that I've heard have the past life regressions. We've been male. We've been female. We've experienced the gamut. Maybe we were straight. Maybe we were gay. Maybe we've experienced many different experiences. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reason, this is the gender we're now in the body we're, we're now in. We come into this world and we experience some sort of disconnect. I'm separate from source. I'm, I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. I don't fit here. There's something. Uh, uh. And we feel this sense of disconnection and I think everybody has that yeah. that whatever that is if I'm you know I, I, no one loves me or I'm not good enough whatever those paradigms are on your soul journey mm -hmm. as you go through sexuality and helping people how are you making the connection between spirituality mm -hmm. and sexuality and becoming a whole being hmm. that's a really great question one of the modalities that I do with clients is called sexological bodywork and is actually hands on sex education and hands on sex healing. Is that some of the things we saw in the feature video? Is that um, that type of thing? Yeah, that would be a version of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are many of men at the end of the session, they will look at me and they'll say, like, what is this? What, where am I? What is this? And I'm like, you're home. And this is you, this is love, this mm. is pure, pure, whatever, fill in the word. And they get to experience that through their pleasure. And um, I mean, that's a very direct way that yeah. some of my clients get to experience it. Um, but I, again, I go back to the, the miraculousness of our, of, our, of our existence, that we're actually here based yeah. from orgasm. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how much more sacred that we could get than that, like yeah. that, that we exist from pleasure, like the existence yeah. of us is pleasure. Yeah. So I, I see pleasure and sacredness as like they're inseparable. Mm -hmm. And giving That's presence beautiful. to the spiritual being, if we are connected to and divine source as part of who we are, sexuality, isn't something that needs to be shamed. It's something that needs to be integrated in us as a whole being. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you do a lot of coaching with people on mm -hmm. how to be a whole being and, and let, letting go the paradigms of fear and shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm also, I am not in the business of telling people what they should or what they shouldn't be doing or what they should be ashamed of or what they shouldn't be ashamed of. That's not my work. So I support people in helping them get in their right relationship to sexuality. Mm -hmm. And that right relationship is a dynamic thing. It's not a stagnant thing. So I support them in getting really clear 
on what is it they want and also what are the beliefs that are hanging out in their mind and in their heart that gives them a chance to say, I have choice over this. And is this, is this a belief that I still want? So I remember there was someone that grew up. Well, I work with a lot of people who grew up with a lot of religion. Yeah. <clears throat> and I remember this, this one guy it was very early on in my career and um, I was doing some exercises with him and he kept looking at me and saying like, is it okay that I feel pleasure right now? Mm. And he kept asking yeah. me that over and over because his programming was like, pleasure is bad. Yep. Yeah. And there was just like this one moment he looked at me, he's like, it's good for me to have pleasure. I'm like, yes, oh, it's good for wow. you to have pleasure. Mm -hmm. And like in that moment, he let go of the script that he was entrenched in yeah. and he adopted a new script yeah. and and that was that was his choice and so i i don't tell people what they should or shouldn't feel mm -hmm. um yeah. and, and let them decide that mm -hmm. and sometimes it's gradual mm -hmm. sometimes it's it takes a while to unwind those beliefs that were yeah. handed to us and that's okay yeah and that's okay and we're all on our our path and mm -hmm. i am not a the way that I live my polyamorous, um, very playful life is not uh, necessarily like the right way. It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm more sexually enlightened and more sexually empowered because I'm living like this um, versus, I, I remember I, I threw this fundraiser for a play I produced. It was the the reverse of the vagina monologues. It was actually giving men a voice. Hmm. Oh, okay. And so I created this play. And, and you created this? Yeah. Oh, it's oh, beautiful. Oh, nice. Yeah. And it was called The Cock Project. Mm. <laughs> and I was doing this fundraiser, and there was 150 people in this house, and it was a 24-hour event, and I was running around naked, and I was like, I'm here on the planet to end toxic sexual shame, and that's my purpose on the planet. And this one woman came up to me at the end of the night, and she was like, she said something like, like it, you don't have to be naked to be sexually empowered. I'm like, you're right. Not at all. <laughs> nope. And that's just my particular expression of how it's being expressed through me. But I don't mm -hmm. judge someone if they don't want to get naked. I don't judge someone if they're in a monogamous relationship or live a different lifestyle. I mean, it's not, that's not, I would be adding shame if I were to do that. Mm -hmm. I would be right. doing the antithesis of my exactly. purpose. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it, it's a huge thing as people really settling in what's right for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, people tend to look at other people, oh, well, you're because you can do that. Mm -hmm. I must not be okay. Mm -hmm. And we got to get over that. Well, and I mean, because it's, it's a scary thing to question the beliefs that we were taught because mm -hmm. there was, when we were children, there was some security of this is how I live. Absolutely. This is how I survive. And these are my beliefs. And this is what's going to keep me safe in the world. So when people start actually questioning those beliefs, it's a scary thing. Cause yeah. it's like, that's mm -hmm. the thing that's kept me safe and alive. And yeah. now you're asking me to like, let go of that. Uh, yeah. If you want to experience something different, I'm inviting you to consider, consider it. that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. We hold on to those things that keep us comfortable. Yeah. Now, to that point, mm -hmm. my question to you is, as we are shedding our paradigms of religion, mm -hmm. we shed our paradigms of our relationship and, you know, it's only one man and one woman before God. And we, we say, what would it be like to have a different relationship? And so a few years ago, I came to Gail and I said, I have only ever been with one woman my entire life. I would kind of like to have an experience with another woman. And she did not want to hear that. She I can imagine. Did not, that, <laughs> that bothered her. It was a shift in what's wrong with me? Am I not good enough? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can give some presence to the way you felt. Well, it was pretty hard mm. because, well, it was around that time where we were kind of going through a lot with our, our son. Um, and so it was a surprise, but it, I mean, it just made me feel like I'm not wanted and how could you start questioning this? And um, basically, I just felt like he still wanted a piece of me. He wanted the piece that I took care of his books and did that part, but the other stuff, he wanted somebody else. Mm. And it was pretty painful. 
And the challenge is yeah. I didn't want someone else. I had the fear of missing out. What would yeah. it have been like or what? Because mm. I never had those opportunities as a young person to be with anyone other than Gail. Now, good news for me. I was madly, I am still madly in love with Gail. Head over heels madly in love with her. Uh -huh. and, <laughs> well, that's where the show gets super sappy and people feel like, oh, I'm going to watch this. But the, the point of this conversation is that I felt like there was something missing. I hadn't gotten an experience. Uh -huh. So I wanted to have that experience. And so we went through a journey. Orgasmic meditation was part of that. Mm -hmm. And then we went through the Kwadoshka, the Shulikwe Kwadoshka training. We did the workshops one and two. And that was a sacred sexuality space where, man, you're, you're sitting naked in a room full of people and you're doing teachings and you're taking notes and then you're doing exercises and you're, you're That's getting That's where rid. we got most of our sex education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Literally, we're learning, you know? oh, there's a lot more to this than boy and girl get together or, you know, same gender couples get together. You rub your parts together and woo, and, you know, there's like, wow, there's a real gravity to this. Uh, there's this space in which you can experience joy and pleasure and you can have that. And so we decide, well, what would that be like to be in a non-monogamous relationship? And as we go on this journey... I find I am experiencing I'm experiencing traumatic results. I'm with people with other ladies and I'm unable to fully engage in that position. And when my partner Gail is with other people, she not only fully it all out there, engages <laughs> with it, she's enjoying it. And it ends up the scenario where I don't enjoy that space and I'm like, well, I have to be conscious. I have to grow and I'm like, huh, ah, ah, I can't, I don't know what to do. And so I've, uh -oh, we need coach on the set. You're I, like, I, right? I've got all that. Well, I've got all the programming of the shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. And then I realize, ah, I'm getting all my validation of who I am from my partner because I feel this, I'm not loved or I'm not accepted, whatever those core wounds are. I feel like, huh, oh, I'm not getting that. And my partner, un unconditionally accepts me no matter what and I realize that there's something in my programming that when I'm with someone else there's a vulnerable space so to me I find sex as a vulnerable oh oh what's gonna happen if I'm not accepted or what if what if I don't do a good enough job mm -hmm. and she doesn't achieve an orgasm what oh and so to me it, it becomes this giant ball of stress mm. Gail's experiences were many opposites of that mm -hmm. Would you care to give a frame on that? <laughs> okay. I guess we're going all out on this. Are you having fun on this? I am. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just love my, I just love this guy for bringing me out here. <laughs> um, so my experiences, um, you know, I, I always, his ideas, like I've always been the supporter of his ideas. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, and you know, I embraced it. Mm. I really did. Mm -hmm. And, um, so you were scared at first. I was definitely and scared And you were the one first. who had the initiate, like the, the seed planting idea. I thought yeah. this would be a great idea to move forward in consciousness. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you embrace it and then you have a hard time actually freaked out. You, right. So you, right. you haven't actually allowed yourself to be with another woman totally relax, surrender and pleasure and, and feel part of my programming is, Oh, I don't want to hurt Gail. I don't want to hurt Gail. Oh, I don't want to hurt Gail. And, uh, what if I'm not accepted? Oh, I'm vulnerable. Mm. So all, yeah. all so it the sounds like a lose, lose situation. It's a lose, lose situation. Yeah. And she's in a situation where she's out with her lover and enjoying herself. Mm -hmm. I'm at home alone crying, mm -hmm. which happened many times. Mm -hmm. Many times. And, and I was, she's never doing anything wrong. Yeah, I got that. Wrong. It's within the yeah. agreement. <sighs> so there's, yeah. And so then I'm like, huh, I don't know. I don't think I can, whew, I don't think I can do this. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you're in a polyamorous lifestyle mm -hmm. where you're able to easily connect with people. And I know you have partners that are in polyamorous lifestyles that are able to connect with people. Mm -hmm. I feel shame and guilt that I kind of want to be in this hunkered down space because I know that the 
she has made some connections with people and I feel bad for him. Mm. Bad for, th- I'm like, oh, I'm a bad person. Mm. I, so then I'm like, well, now even in non-monogamy, I'm, I'm running through shame cycles. Mm-hmm. This is not a comfortable place to be. Yeah. And I think, well, maybe in non-monogamy, there's more consciousness. But then in, in monogamy, you know, uh, is it just that I want safety? Is it just that that's a safety zone for me? Mm-hmm. What do you think that is, doctor? Tell me more. There you go. Well, I have a lot of things to say about all that. And I want to start with that there have been some research and studies that have they're starting to believe that that we have either a predisposition for monogamy or a predisposition for polyamory. And there are actually differences in people showing up. Mm. And they they are starting to make that link studying, I think it's ground groundhogs. No. Prairie dogs, prairie dogs, because they're, they're finding within certain um, types of, of prairie dogs, one type is monogamous and one type is, is non-monogamous, oh, wow. and they're finding the gene that's separate from that, and they're connecting that with us. Hmm. So there are people, I believe, based on the research that I've read mm. and what's coming out, is that some of us actually are more monogamous and some of us are more polyamorous and it doesn't make either one of us right or wrong mm-hmm. it's just it's just what's so for some people mm. so that's one thing so i need to go have some gene testing then okay. yeah uh-huh right <laughs> that'll be the next uh one two three right. yeah yeah, yeah. Thing. <laughs> ancestry.com Ancestry. no, it'll be polyamory monogamy.com <laughs> there we go new idea yeah. oh yes new business idea okay. <laughs> right um, the, right here. The other thing too is I I relate to relationships and my entrepreneurial career uh, as a spiritual practice personally, and I think that whatever path people choose, whether it's monogamy or non-monogamy or something in between, that there is shadow and there is light in both of them, and mm-hmm. there's tremendous Absolutely. things to learn from both of them, and. We are all here to learn our own individual lessons and we have our own areas of shame. Like for me, I was born pretty naturally polyamorous and Mm. I didn't have to like learn how to deal with my jealousy as much as most people do. It's not, it's not a thing for me. Mm. Now I have other issues. I've been, I've had been an overeater, addicted to food, binge eating. And like my Achilles heel and nemesis has been food. Mm. And I have had a lot of shame around that. Um, But I didn't have to deal with a lot of the jealousy that that other people have. Mm -hmm. So So that's a good point that we all have our things. Mm. Yeah, we do. Yeah, all of us. I like that. And, And, you know, I used to work with people with disabilities and the difference between us like able-bodied humans and disabled humans is their quote unquote disabilities are on the outside and can be seen, but we all have our own insecurities mm-hmm. and our disabilities. And sometimes they're harder to find within within ourselves. Like yeah. so we, can, we can like mask it or hide it, but we all have it. And that's what makes us human. Mm-hmm. There's a new book out called Untrue. She talks about a study where the female in a relationship gets bored with the relationship a lot faster than the male but yet it's always attributed to the male as the one always kind of looking out for you know what else is out there but what they find is a lot of times uh men and women get in relationships uh, and they get married and between one year and four years the wife kind of gets bored and then gets disinterested in the monogamous relationship that is a challenge where then the men think oh the wife isn't interested in the husband thinks my wife isn't interested in sex The reality is, for whatever that paradigm that she's in, she's lost interest in her relationship. Hmm. And Do you have anything that you can speak to that about? Have you heard that? I haven't heard that, and I would speak from the evolutionary, um, the evolutionary biologists would have Mm -hmm. opposite views on that, and so I'm I'm kind of surprised about that because well, I I mean, sex at dawn seed, uh, yeah, you know, because that was a, a big a big uh, influencer too, yeah. where he said that the female were, would mate with many different mates mm. and it, she didn't want to be stuck with one mate. So I think that was her perspective is that the female is like, oh, okay, I only have one partner. And so her drive would decrease. I've actually, and I've also heard of other cultures where I can't remember the specific, specifics of it, but 
the women would have sex with lots of men so that no one would know yeah. whose mm -hmm. the father was yeah. so that the whole tribe would take care of the whole tribe. Yep. Yeah. So whose dad are you? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm dads. in the village. Yep. The child is in the village yep. and that's what matters. Yeah. So I think it's all over the map. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that the moment we think we have it figured out, I think there's something yeah. else to look at. Yeah. Well, there's indigenous tribes in the South Pacific where the, uh, the culture was such that the energy of sexuality, mm -hmm. if someone is sick, they'll lie down and everybody will go around them and they'll uh, they'll call all the people to come in and start having sex around them because it raises the mm -hmm. sexual energy and they're receiving that. And so the sick person's like, oh, I'm receiving the sexual energy from all these Ooh. people in the room. Yeah. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, it's fascinating. That's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah. My other favorite one is um, hearing about the priestess woman where the men would go to war and before they would come home to their families, they would visit the priestesses mm. and the women would fuck the war out of them. Mm. And oh. transmute and transmute the the trauma and the pain and the pain yeah. into into pleasure, so they can come back with a more regulated nervous system. I don't know that they would have access to that, knowing it's a regulated nervous that's system. But that's right. actually what's what's happening. It's like mm. yeah. getting the the trauma literally out of you through pleasure and through energy. Mm. So that sounds like a pretty, I, sounds like a pretty good solution to me, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, you know, I think so. Instead of bringing all that trauma back to to somebody who doesn't know how to deal with it, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's good. Okay, so yes, there's this guy that really enjoys monogamy. Oh, back to this. What oh, if yeah, this guy yeah. is with someone? Some hypothetical guy. Some, some hypothetical, hypothetical guy. Yeah. Okay. Is with someone that enjoys non-monogamy. What would that guy do as a paradigm shift, either to? Convince his partner to be different or to convince himself to be different. What does that guy have to do to be in that space so he doesn't um, suffocate and yeah. cry all the time? So he would go to www.hazelgraceyates.com and sign up for a 45-minute discovery session to find out how we could support them. Mm. <laughs> that was a very good, a very good plug there. Well, Usually we ask you for that plug. Thank you for just doing it. Just it just seemed like the alley oop. It was like set up perfect. for it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, that is sounds like a really challenging and uncomfortable confronting conversation. Conversation and 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 what I will say to this hypothetical person uh, is the thing that's going really well is the foundation of love mm -hmm. and without that it's a pretty tough conversation but if there's that then there's i think something that can be looked at and felt yeah. and and i don't know which party I, I don't know which party that there's something to let go of or look at right i, I don't know mm -hmm. where it is but um that's a Pretty mm -hmm. big question. Well, you know, it's interesting that I find in all these conversations. I mean, we talk about the one to four years and this and that. Really, it's so individual. It has mm. so much to do with your programming that we had. And, you know, did your parents talk to you? Did your parents not talk to you? Um, what kind of wound did you have? What kind of trauma do you have? What is really at play amongst the relationship? Because to me, it seems like a lot of times it's, um, something that we're dealing with outside of that, that's mm -hmm. really at play in that type of situation. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like, yeah, it's not an easy, just one size fits no. all answer. No, not at all. It's definitely an individual thing. And epigenetics is starting to show us that we have lineage and ancestral trauma that we can scientifically yeah. prove. Hmm. So this hypothetical person who knows what trauma that has been trans like that is showing yeah, up currently that is not even in this lifetime that but it's in the it's in the mm -hmm. the dna and the bones yeah yeah absolutely yeah. so that's a whole nother like whew, i know mm -hmm. another <laughs> can of worms yeah uh the the relationship of being married for such a long time there's a lot of people that transition their kids are grown they go to college they move on they become empty nesters and they're like hey let's let's open our marriage up 
the difference between someone who's had many experiences before they got married and then someone who had zero experiences before they got married, only been with one, the religious mindset is like, oh, we're going to honor you because you made the best choice. You only saw one person naked and you married her. You're the best. High five. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, oh, you were given all this uh, shame that that's the way, that's the right way to do it. And mm -hmm. so you were never allowed to experience that. And so then you get down the road 30 years and you want to, you want to have that consciousness, that openness, but phew, you're flooded with all that, uh, imprinting the yogic path calls it the samskara, the rut, the limiting the belief system, the groove in the record, the mm -hmm. groove that you've got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you've been told this is the right way to do things. And if you try to do something that's outside of that paradigm, you know, whether it's sexuality or your political party or spirituality versus mm -hmm. religion, whatever that paradigm is, mm -hmm. that's a big shift. Mm -hmm. uh, do you deal with relationships with people that um, are, are, you know, couples that are older, not like 30 year old people, but 50 year old people? I mean, have you had experience dealing with that? Um, my target audience I tend to be closer in my in my range and mm. I personally 20, 22 year old people and yeah uh, 25 year old 37 oh, 37 oh. what <laughs> yeah um and and also I don't tend to work with c couples who've been married for a long time the people who are usually attracted to me are someone who have has a similar story as me mm. so I wouldn't say that long-term married couples is my my specialty mm -hmm. um so that's how i would answer that question makes sense yeah mm -hmm. so you've got people coming to you that have had trauma or they've had something that they've had to deal with and they're trying to get over those old paradigms well a lot of people don't know that they have trauma mm. yeah so it's usually that in finding out a little bit more about their history and doing some work stuff will yeah. come up and then we get to do, I get to be my like, my little magical witchy, like I have my toolbox of all of my modalities that I've got to train with and I get to play with all these different things to help them basically rewire their brain mm. and rewire yes. their nervous system mm -hmm. um, to, yeah. to the thing that they're saying that they want. So sometimes people come to me because they have explicit awareness of trauma and most of the time it's just... A guy who has premature ejaculation or um, a couple who – I do have couples who come to me that, that are sexless. I do have that. Um, some women, women who've never had an orgasm or um, some women are just like, I don't know how to ask for what I want in bed. Or some women are like, I don't know how to have boundaries. I need to learn how to reclaim mm -hmm. my body and have boundaries. That's good. So it's, it really runs the gamut. and. Mm -hmm. I love that because I get bored really easily and not in this job because I really never know who is going to pick up the phone and, mm -hmm. and call me. So, Give yeah. presence to some of those issues that you work with and, and what are some of the things that you are helping people with? Mm -hmm. A lot of men want to learn how to last longer because there's a lot of Tell pressure. me more. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Uh, you yeah. can you can keep going on the different types of people. <laughs> well, men do want to last longer, and and almost the answer to any of those things that I just mentioned, whether they they haven't had an orgasm or they're not having sex yet, or you know they're not having their sexless marriage or, or what have you. I almost always start with your awareness of your body. What are you noticing? What are you feeling? What are you aware of? Because the more connected we can be to our sensations, our emotions, our bodies, then we have more access of choice over our bodies. And it's also a gateway for connection with other, which is really mm -hmm. what sexuality for a lot of people is about, is connection. Yeah. So it's easier for us to connect with one another when we have access to, to what's here. Mm. And so the place that I start with men who want to last longer is like, okay, let's do some breathing exercises and notice what's happening in your body and notice it as moment to moment, just like the own practice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's noticing, 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 noticing. Um, and, and, uh, and a lot of times it's, it's, it's pressure to perform. Yeah. So then it's, so then it's also looking at what are your beliefs? 
so it's it's what are you thinking and what are you feeling is where I start with mm-hmm. with almost everyone. Hmm. Yeah, and then programming and yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. Yep. So you get to be a little detective and unravel mm-hmm. stuff. Yes. Yes. It's very fun. So Gail, what is your perspective on this whole thing? Because I'm sure there's people that want to hear from you. I've said a whole bunch of stuff and <laughs> been really vulnerable. Excuse me while I get on the hot seat here. So <laughs> maybe you share with Hazel Grace your perspective mm-hmm. on uh, where you feel comfortable with. Um, let's see. Where do I feel comfortable? I think that the process that we've gone through has allowed us to really get into a space of learning more about ourselves. Mm. In a huge way. And actually, um, by giving each other permission to go out and um, have different experiences has probably brought brought us closer than we've ever been Mm -hmm. in our marriage. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. The uh, discovery of something new has been really important, specifically for your journey. Yeah. You know, when you kind of get to my age. (laughs) 27? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, 28. Oh. You're 27, right? So, no. no, I think I was 22, but <laughs> oh, okay. close enough. I'll, I'll take 27 then. <laughs> okay. um, you know, for me through this whole process is like just reclaiming my body. Mm. You know, after having three kids, being stretched the snot out of, you know, and all the trauma of having those kids. Um, and then just the other trauma that I had is... It's actually allowed me to get into a space where I accept me Mm. and myself Mm. more. And I think that's one of the reasons where um, it's just brought me to a new level Mm. and been really good for me Mm. in that in that way. Yeah. And just, you know, feeling like, okay, somebody else can like me. Oh, okay. That's exciting. (laughs) You Uh know? I mean, it is because yeah. you kind of get in that space where you're like, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of getting old as, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it feels like there's like a revis- revitalization. Oh, absolutely. And a, and a claiming of your body and, yeah. self re- and self-respect and self-love yeah. and connecting here, yeah. which has you show up even more in your relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as I was talking about earlier about the monogamy and polyamory, both paths, there's the shadow and the light. And I think what can happen in monogamous relationships is there's ways and places we can hide or people can hide. Like you don't have to deal with certain things. Absolutely. And so by you shifting the, the nature of your relationship or the experimentation, there were things that you didn't have to deal with, you didn't have to look at, you didn't have yeah. to be with until the, sh- the, the context shifted. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Which both of us had to deal with stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So to yeah. me, that's why I, I was saying it's a spiritual practice because it's like, okay, there's some part of me that doesn't feel loved. There's some part of me that doesn't feel whole. There's some part mm-hmm. of me. And by, yeah. p- by you doing this, it, it put a spotlight on those areas absolutely. and an opportunity to, to, to transform something that's, actually always been there Mm -hmm. yeah like like before y'all met yeah yeah like it has nothing really to do with either one of you it's been there it's just giving you the opportunity as your not a comfortable opportunity (laughs) absolutely (laughs) not comfortable it's it's, it's probably yeah a, a path that was definitely brought about a lot of conversation Right. A lot of conversation. And and Mm -hmm. that was probably the most important part of it is us just really being willing to um, always bring it to the table and bring what we're feeling and dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And some days it was hours of conversation and then coming back and having more hours of conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it's a point where a lot of people would have just split. Mm. And Instead of doing that, what we realized, especially through doing the Kwadoshka training, is finding that piece of us where I felt my um, lack of choice and he felt his lack of love, -love, Mm self-love, and identifying what was at play. And through that, we actually went through um, a reframe on our marriage, which was a bonding ceremony, Mm. and a reframe on our rings and everything to Mm. allow ourselves to have 
that freedom of choice. Mm. So, yeah, we transmuted the yeah. energy of the ring not to be an obligation, but to be an act of choice. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I want all the people to do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it was huge. Mm-hmm. huge. It's amazing. And I'm gonna assert that that wouldn't or couldn't have happened if you both weren't so committed to both your individual self and the we space that you are. Yeah. And yeah. that is what I imagine led to you being here now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's a very beautiful way to put it. Mm-hmm. Mm. I like it. Um, give presence to your work. Give a presence to how people can find you. Mm-hmm. Y- you have in-person sessions and then do you do Skype or do you do yep. computer stuff? Mm-hmm. Give presence to that. Yeah. So I work with individuals and couples and essentially any area of people's life around intimacy, sexuality, and their relationship where things just suck and aren't awesome Mm -hmm. and feeling disconnected from their bodies that want to feel freedom to feel innocence to play feel playful to feel uh, lots of pleasure Mm. um i i support them and the ways that i support them are very very there's a lot um and i do work with them individually or um zoom platform, video platform, Mm -hmm. and then I work with people and I use hands-on, as I mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. hands-on technique called sexological body work, which is one of my trainings. And then I also have workshops and retreats. And I love workshops because (sighs) there's so much transformation that happens so efficiently with a group of people, the field of people that support one another. That's why I love it so much because there's only so much I can do one-on-one, but having Mm -hmm. a group of people do work that I can't actually do by myself. Yeah. It's so inspiring to me. It's so fun. And it's also a lot of adrenaline for me because it's, you know, 30 hearts and humans and stories and filters uh, that I'm experiencing, yeah. that I'm, I'm yeah. holding with care and love. And, vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. And vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Love it. Mm-hmm. At the end of the episode, mm-hmm. we like to give the guests the opportunity to say, if there's one thing mm. that I want the audience to take away from today, it's this one thing. Mm. So what would that be for you? Mm. Whatever your relationship to sexuality right now is perfect, whole, and complete. Mm. Beautiful. That's good. Hazel Grace, thanks for being a part of our journey. (laughs) Thank you for being a part of our show. (laughs) Namaste, my friend. (laughs) Namaste. Thanks for joining us here on Exploring the Human Journey. You can find us as a video on YouTube or listen to us as a podcast. You can also join in the conversation by following us on Facebook and Instagram. For more information, go to the website at exploringthehumanjourney.com.